Hi everyone, this is Julie Bruns. Welcome to the Peace and Possibilities Podcast. I want you to thrive and be happy, peaceful, and content, no matter where you are on your journey. This podcast shares stories that will show you how it can be done, no matter what your circumstances. You'll be inspired and come away with a new spark of an idea. Never forget, anything is possible. New episodes are released every Wednesday. Subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. This helps others find our content and get happier sooner. To possibility and the end. All right, welcome everyone. My guest this week is Lorette Ronzene. And Lorette and I don't know each other very well. We met through a mutual friend, one of my very best friends. She and I have been actually friends um, almost 40 years, if you can believe that. Wow, that's amazing. Um, my good friend, Leanne, I'm just going to say it. Her name is Leanne, and, and I love her dearly. And she and you um, are neighbors, and that's how we met. We were. I've been out. friends with Leanne for like at least probably 14 years, I'd say. Yeah, which is a long time, right? I mean, it is a long time. Yeah. And she just moved, and now she's not my neighbor, and now she's your neighbor, and I'm sad. I know. <laughs> I have to say, I am liking that. Um, yeah, so we met in, in, in Lorette, you know, I don't know how much you know about me, but in general, this podcast is about, um, interviewing people that love what they do. And when I met you, I just, I loved your energy and I wanted to find out more about you. And, and that's the great thing about having your own, your own thing. You just decide who you want to have on. I'm like, you know, that's fun. I like that. And talk about, you know, what you do and, and how you figured it out and your journey here. So, um, thanks for joining. I'm, I'm happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. This is my first podcast ever. So, wow. Oh, cool. Good. <laughs> I'm honored. You are. Um, I, th- I don't think it's going to be your last. I think this is a big, so I started doing this almost two years ago and um, they've been around for a while podcasts, but I think in general, um, people will start them and just do a couple and then they'll go away or, you know, but th- everyone's doing them now. They're like the normal. I thing. totally agree. And I think it's something even with, you know, the COVID <laughs> as we call it in this house. Yeah. that I've gotten so much more into podcasts than I ever had before. Mm-hmm. Eating up Brene Brown, love her. Um, yeah. Kind of what I do as I get ready in the morning. It's, it's, it kind of gets you going, you know, and getting it does. every day. Especially if you're in, of course, if you're in, and most of them are inspiring and, and uplifting and like teach you new things. It's, it's a great way to um, just grow and learn. So I love mm-hmm. them and that's why I have them. So good. Okay, so first question is, um, tell everyone what you do and your journey. Like, did you always know that you were going to be, I kind of know what you do, but did you always know you were going to be in this role? Did you think you were going to be in this role? And did you study in school and um, throughout your life to get where you are now? Tell us about that. Yes. (laughs) Yes, yes, and yes. Um, So I'm the youngest of seven. We have some similarities in these big families. And I am, um, we have five five girls and two boys. My brother was heir apparent of Edlong, which is the company that I am the CEO and owner of now. And I think as far as did I always know I wanted to do this job, it was it, it was interesting. So my brother was 10 years older than me and he went to K-State. My dad had it all kind of planned out. You're going to be a biochemist. You're going to run Edlong, yada, yada, yada. And then um, when I was in about eighth grade, my brother's like, this is not my dream. I don't want to do this. Meanwhile, have you ever seen the movie Whale Rider? One of my favorite movies, Whale Rider. So. Oh, it's so good. It's like New Zealand. Literally, it's only the boys that can ride the whale. It's a oh, tearjerker of a movie. I think so. so. I think it's like it's like 10 years old or a little bit more, right? Old, I think I remember yeah. watching it. Yeah. It's an oldie, oldie, but a goodie. So, um, yeah, I just, I always knew I wanted to do this. I, I spent a lot of time on a fishing boat up at our cottage with my dad and his best friend, who was our neighbor. It was like a campus, if you can imagine. So our seven kids, their five kids, dinner was at one house or the other, the moms, you know, kids running around. So I went on the fishing boat and RW, my dad's best friend runs Kemen, um, big company in Iowa, in Des Moines, Iowa. And they would talk business all the time and I would just listen to them and and kind of absorbed a lot. And there was a real, in the, in that era, like a disconnect between R and D and sales, for example. And what I love is like connecting people, you know, connecting, making the teams really unite and like get on fire. So I heard that always said, I'm going to do it. That's what I'm going to do. So I went to Purdue, um, food science and business major, ended up working at ball corporation and Keebler. I was an intern at Keebler. That was huge. 
transformation in my life because that's when I started realizing I should pay attention to what I'm learning in school because you get there and they're like okay go make a cookie and you got to make it melt and spread and I'm like I have no idea how to do this so I started paying attention so I was at Ball in Muncie Indiana for a while and then my dad called me I think it was 92 or 93 I always forget what year 93 and he's like it's time to come to the business and um, so that's when I started and really started and not by design, it kind of happened by a fluke of nature, but I wanted to join as like technical liaison, technical sales. Then we had this perfect storm event happen at Edlong. So my dad had put in some new spray dryers, huge equipment, very expensive loan from the bank. And then we lost our biggest customer. So the bank called the loan. And that good friend I was talking about up in Michigan flew into O'Hare with a million dollars in briefcase or whatever it was, paid off the loan, kind of bought us some time. And my dad looked at me and he's like, so do you want to go for it or not? And I'm like, well, hell yeah. Or else you're going to be living with me. (laughs) That won't be good. So at that time I had just gotten married, had a six month old baby, lived in a two bedroom condo. Um, And it was like a crucible to live through that. And, but it was so I learned so much. It was so exciting and it was really even fun. We would talk every night. We came, we were reading um, Good to Great was kind of the book that really I'd say changed our life because we did the hedgehog concept and we decided that really what we're the best in the world at is dairy flavors. So we do flavors and um, there's so many flavor companies that are everything to everybody. And we, said this is going to be our niche and to this day so that was you know many many years ago now we are the only flavor company that focuses on the niche dairy and non-dairy so with the plant-based and the vegan it's the space that we own and i'm really grateful for that because we compete with the big boys and it's um it was a blessing so in 18 months the bank took all the personal guarantees and everything my dad signed his life away on and they said this was the quickest turnaround they'd ever seen so Wow, was, that's awesome. It was, it was very fun. That's when I think we became true partners, you know, going through that together. Okay, I have a lot to, so, all right. So number one, having a niche, this is something I I'm going to relate it to writing a book, even though I'm not necessarily, I wasn't born to be a writer. I've only written one book, but one of the first things I learned and it was one of the best pieces of advice was if you're trying to speak to everyone, you will speak to no one. Yep. And it kind of sounds like what you guys did with your business. Like we want to be everything to everyone. Then you can't do anything. Well, it's like being Jack of all trades, master of none. You never Right. Have- I totally agree. Oh, I got chills. Totally yeah. agree. Like you can be average at everything or you can be the master. Exactly. And that is, that's the role that we've taken. It was and I, brilliant. It was cool. I also think it's cool that your brother realized. So your the brother that's 10 years older than you. Is he the oldest in the family? No, funny enough. Okay. He's not. He's the second oldest brother. Okay. And I, I really don't know why my dad kind of tagged him as the one, um, you know, you're going to be the one. must have seen something. But yeah. I love that he was like this, like, so you're in eighth grade. So you're 12 or 13. He's, t- he's 10 years older than you. He's 22, 23. He's like this. I don't want this. And you were like right. something. And you were like, I kind of want that. The fact I've that always, and I knew I've always wanted it, Julie. I was like, my mom used to play free to be you and me, like drill it into my head. I don't know if you remember that, but I totally remember with Marley, <laughs> is it Marlo Thomas. Yes. Yeah. And it's like the babies are born and they're both bald and they can't figure out if they're a boy or a girl. And the one's like, I want to be a doctor. That must mean I'm the boy. And then, you know, the other oh one's like, but it, I want to be a nurse. I must be the girl. And then they figure out that it's totally complete. I like that stuck with me as a little kid. Like wow. and my parents were really good at that too. You can be anything you want to be, you know, don't right. have it be gender. So yeah. I love that. And I love that your dad asked you that question. So we're going for it or not. Like what a great, defining a moment for you and a great way to say it not like what do you think let's talk about it. he's like we're going for it aren't we like let's just, like we have to put the hammer down and let's right. just make the decision and then once you make the decision I'll never forget that like I can visualize that you know that moment he had a huge desk he was six foot five huge man he used to be a you know big football player um and he would shake hands everyone would always talk about how he would shake hands he did that handshake you know you knew you got a handshake Mm-hmm. So I was sitting and I used to, that was my seat. I would sit next to his desk. We'd chat about everything. And, and I'm like, dad, of course we're going for it. We have no, no other option. So buckle up buttercup. <laughs> That's what Leanne says. <laughs> buckle up buttercup. Um, you, yeah. You just, just go for it. And then if you made a mistake, at least you can say we did everything. We, we, we tried everything. 
right? We, we made all the sacrifices. We did what we wanted to do. And if it failed, at least you can say you tried everything. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have no regrets in that regard. That's no wonderful. regrets. That's a good, a good thing to say. Exactly. Yeah. I love that you were that young and you knew it though, or even before then that you knew it, because I don't think that's so common. I think there's people that think they know, or they're, or they, they say they know because they were told and they don't know that right. they were told. They just think it was their idea. So I like, think oh. that's such a good point because it was such a different route for me than for my brother. Like he was being told and I wanted it. So it's interesting to think about that, even with our five boys, you know, of what the next generation would look like. And I wouldn't want anybody working there that doesn't want it. I have a 25 year old who I would love to want it, but it's not his path, or at least not right now, maybe someday, yeah, but maybe. you have to love this job. So your topic is, is so dead on and you have to have the passion. Yeah. And um, just, and just to know something intrinsically um, when you're young and get feelings about things, I think we always get feelings about things, but I think especially girls were taught to be like, all right. I mean, you're a girl. You're not going to run the company someday. You know, like, you, that it, didn't horrible? Sound, it, didn't like it didn't sound like anyone was going to deter you anyways. But, you know, I'm mm -hmm. sure there were people that were like you, like you have all these uh, you have a couple of brothers. Why can't it? You know, it's probably going to be one of them. It's not going to be you. It didn't even care. You didn't even care. It's so true. And I think the era, you know, my dad was born in 33. So and he passed away in 2007. But um, that era, the hardest thing for him, I would I would call him a male chauvinist. I think he was, I think many men were then, you know, it was like mm -hmm. the Mad Men era. The hardest thing for him was, oh shit, this is going to be my daughter. <laughs> and how, and I remember one meeting, I had to literally fire my boss at one point. Um, so the man, he was the president and I was vice president at this time. You know, I, I got to do a lot of different things before that happened, which was great. Um, and I just told my dad, I'm like, he's toxic and it's just not working. And had to talk him into it. And my dad's like, okay, fine. But how are you going to do this? Now I had two kids at that time. So I just had another baby who was six months old and a, you know, four-year-old. I'm like, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. And it's through a lot of help. I have a lot of, help. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it like, it made him kind of sad even like he was like, I want you to do this, but how are you going to do that and that? And is that not our generation? I mean, we've had to figure this out, mm -hmm. especially this year, this year. Oh, I feel so just women have really carried the weight of everything is in terms of children, you know, in school. And it's just been, it's been hard, very hard. Yeah. Like we already didn't have enough on our plates and then we have to do right? that we're not either. <clears throat> I'm a, I have a degree in teaching and I still was like, if I had kids at home right now and I had to teach them and work, and even if I didn't have to work and I just had to teach them, I'm like, it's different learning from your parents than it is being in school. Well, and you know how to teach. Like I can't, so my youngest has dyslexia. So he's 13, um, graduated from his IEP in fifth grade. So now he's in seventh grade. And then this hit and school went zoom. I felt like a horrible mother. He had all F's, which I didn't even really care about at all. It was his self-confidence that was mm -hmm. totally shaken and lots of tears by both of us. So the teacher would, you know, the head teacher would call me and be like, get on Google docs and, you know, you have to do this and that. I'm like, I have a full-time job and I'm a horrible teacher. Yeah. I cannot sit with him all day and do that. And Oh, it was so bad. I, I remember having that conversation and I was on a zoom call with my leadership team, lost it, just started crying on the call. You know, it's like, Oh, what do you do? You're like, I ended up um, re doing, I got an educational advocate. I never even knew that was a thing. She was so helpful of navigating the IEP system. And all. I don't know anything about that. So we had to get a case study, got his IEP reinstated. And quite frankly, it went 360. That teacher that was making us cry, we ultimately ended up loving. And she was, she was crying at the end of the year because he got all A's and B's and he Aww, pulled it. I love that. So it was awesome. But, and he got a lot of support that he needed that I didn't even know was available, didn't know. Mm -hmm. So it ended yes. up being a good story, but it was rough. And I, and I think, I know I'm not alone. And I, like I said, I have a lot of help. Think of a single mom who, you know, doesn't have that kind of help or family around. That was bad. That's why there's so many women that dropped out of the workforce this year. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I mean, how do you do it all? And we weren't trained to do that. And frankly, I have friends that are teachers and administrators and they weren't trained how to do this either and, and, and teach, you know, so I can see all both sides of it. 
Um, totally. It hard, yeah, it was hard for everyone. And then the poor kids, like you, you, I, I was the same way. I was a great student when I was in class, but when I, even in college, I took one, it was called, it was not, it was called self-study at the time. It wasn't even online learning. It was just right. basically go do your homework and then mail it into the professor. That's what you had to do. And I got <laughs> a D in that class and I was normally an AB student who didn't have to try very hard. And I'm like, oh, I'm missing the interaction. I'm missing the face-to-face. -face. That's how I learn the best. And I, Me too. I'm not, I'm not, I'm a good reader, et cetera, but I, I, I just was not on task and on target with that. And I, and I almost failed that class. And I'm like, note to self in the future, I'm not taking any self-study classes. So I feel for those kids that were good students. And then all of a sudden they're like, I'm, I'm a bad student now. Cause I'm learning online. No, 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 you're not. You just don't have all the tools you need and it sucks. Um, but yeah, we, we've yeah. All a lot and then, uh, I think he gets a lot of his self-esteem because he's a, an amazing athlete and all that stopped. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't getting any of the plus in his bucket, so to yep. speak, you know, it was all the negative stuff. And that was, I would not want to redo that. I said like PTSD over that year. So oh, I bet. <laughs> I bet. And your son's lucky to have you that, and a parent that said, all right, like, what are the resources? So you're, you're stressed out, but you could have just stayed in that place and he could have just mm -hmm. con gone downhill. But instead you said, all right, what, are, what do we have out there? What are the options? What are the resources? And there always are. But when you're stuck in the middle of it, it's hard to see. You're stay. almost like paralyzed. I was. It's a good point. I really, I didn't even know where to go or who to, I wasn't asking anybody I, like, help. So yeah. And then you finally find the answer, but you do get a little paralyzed. I was looking for, literally looking for an in-home teacher. You know, I'm like, I need somebody that. Yeah. Homeschooling. And I ended up with like, yeah, homeschooling. I ended up with this, the Hey Tutor group and, um, and did get a tutor. It wasn't like all day teaching or anything. He, and the tutor's like, he doesn't need that. He just needs some help, you know? That was hugely helpful too. Yeah. So I'm, so the big theme there is ask for help. So you're, you're admitting you have help. Um, you're admitting you needed help and you ask for help and there's always help around. I think women, we also tell ourselves like we have to figure it all out. I think um, right. it's men, men to do this, you know, but especially mothers you are like, okay, I, I can do this. Like right. I mean, I, my mom gave me the best advice back to, you know, playing free to be you and me constantly and like brainwashing me. I remember her saying, and so you know, a mother of seven who really had no options in that era. And she was born in 34. Uh, um, you, you know, college wasn't really a thing and Catholic on top of it. So her mission in life was have as many babies as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she was brought up. So I think she was really trying to instill in me, you know, you have options, you're going to have options. And the advice she gave me was delegate the non-value added things such as laundry, uh, cleaning the kitchen mm -hmm. and it's huge it's huge and sometimes you have to stop I mean I think even at work we talk about this of delegate to elevate mm -hmm. think of the things like I'd rather I, you know cooking a meal with my kids is, is fun um, you know something where you're getting connection versus right. you're just doing stupid mindless errands and there's no connection and work all day and then do that and there's yeah so so I've definitely followed that advice. I have like a house manager that she's been with me for as long as Declan's been born pretty much. So 13 years or so. And Maria, she's my lifeline um, that, you know, that I can do what I need to do. And she, and then I don't have to like walk out of my office and to a pig's die and then you got to clean your house and that just leads mm -hmm. to a crappy mother. So. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Delegate to elevate and you can't get everything done. And if you, even if you could get it all done and you probably could, you'd, you'd be crabby. You wouldn't yes. be a good mom. You wouldn't be a good wife. You wouldn't be a good leader at your company. You'd be right. good at nothing. You just would be crabby and all that stuff. Need, it needs to get done. So it's like, figure, figure it out. Like, do you have the budget to do something about it? Or can some of that stuff just go away? Cause it doesn't matter. Right. Um, it, doesn't, right. it doesn't have to be done every day or whatever it is. Okay, and so I think there's a, there's a cool yeah. thing that we just started at, um, at Edlong. It's called traction. I don't, did we talk about that? I can't remember. I don't think we did. So it's a, they call it like an entrepreneurial operating system, but, um, that, that has been like so huge as far as figuring out my role. So you have to, so we started it last summer, my executive leadership team, and they start with accountability charts. This was such an aha moment to me, but the visionary, there's a, below the visionary, there's an integrator. That's the role I never had anybody in that role, nor did I even know it existed. It has changed my life because back to the delegate, the elevate, my integrator is my CFO and she's a phenomenal integrator. She does all the stuff that I suck at and lets me be the visionary, the culture, the big relationships, the relationships with employees. Like that's what I love. 
-hmm. And she is like detailed, you know, financial, legal, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. that she makes sure things get accomplished and accountable. And I'm like, yeah, Mm -hmm. I'm on to the next thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just, yeah, I think it's just really important to know what you love and and what, you know, and then your strengths, like, you know, that's her strength. It's not, you know, it's so we get along amazingly well, but we're very opposite, you know? Yes. You need that, especially for a company. You need, you need to balance all of that. If you were only ever having ideas, nothing would ever get executed. And she was, that's where we were. I mean, that's exactly where we were for many years. It was like, that's great ideas, but the execution is the part that really got me stuck. And I was talking to my a girlfriend that's on female strong board with me. And I'm like, oh, we just have such a hard time with the execution. And she's the one that introduced me to attraction. And it's been awesome for us. So that's cool. I'm going to check that out. That'll be great in my next, next leadership role. That's cool. I'm going to learn more about that. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about you and your, um, let's talk about advice. Like, so you're a leader, obviously in your company and you probably mentor and you probably are surrounded by all kinds of different age groups, right? Men and women, yes. different ages. What do you, when people come to you and say, I want to do something that's meaningful. I want to change my role. Or you hear that this is happening with your teams and stuff. What kind of advice do you give to them? Um, what do you say to people that are saying, I, I want to be more purposeful. I want it something more meaningful, or I like what I'm doing, but I want this also or something. What do you say to those people? Um, I think you definitely have to follow your dreams. I'm thinking of some of the, um, particularly the youngins, I guess, millennials. I'm not really good at the who's, who's what age group, but have done some really major switches, like being in R and D and switching over to IT. I think that's brave. I think it's incredibly brave. My son is kind of going through that right now. So my 25 year old had a horrible breakup over the holidays and he was living in Denver and ended up, it was so bad. He came home to kind of heal and get his feet back on the ground. And he's working at Ed Long right now. Just, you know, as I said, not forever, for sure. Matter of fact, he's like, I've learned that I hate a desk job. I like it. You know, yeah. what you hate right it's really good to learn what you hate and um he's just trying to kind of figure out what, what he would love to do is you know I think there's something I want to do in my hands whatever and he's really smart econ major division one football guy I mean lots to offer so the world's kind of your oyster you know and you got to find your calling and your purpose I think um definitely feel like I'm waking up to that as I'm getting older and more experienced in my career, that it, it, there's some element of wanting people to really own their calling, own their legacy. Um, yeah. And something about women. There's definitely something here about women and the whole imposter syndrome. And we got to get rid of that. And yeah, agreed. Um, and try to be, yeah, just be your, who you are unapologetically. I love that. And, that, and it's also like your son. If you figuring out what you hate gets you closer to figuring out what you love. So some people will just say, I really don't know, but I know I really don't like this. And I don't like that. That's great. You just check something else off your, the box and you just took something that you're, you thought I'm, I don't like your son. I don't want to run this business someday, but maybe I'll work there a little bit. He works a little bit because I don't even want to be behind a desk. Okay. Well, that doesn't mean you don't necessarily, maybe someday you do take over, but you're not behind a desk. You're doing something else in that realm, but you know, it's not behind a desk. And right. In, in, in real know. life, I'm usually never behind a desk like this. I'm never, yeah. you know, I'm never, I'm in real life meetings like this all day long instead of, so this is kind of a weird year, but yeah. 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 So I think I, he's, um, there's an industrial psychologist. Have you ever heard of those? Um, I love her name's Sarah Evans. I'm throwing a lot of na- people's names out here. Um, so she, we at Edlong use her when we're making big hires. So she does this Hogan test and some cognitive tests. And, and I've done all of these tests with her. I think most of my executive leadership team has, I think, yeah, everybody has now. So it really helps when we're making a, so we just hired a chief innovation officer. So like the chief science guy. Yeah. Um, and it helps to see how the team fits together. Yes. So I love that. Like, for example, I'm really not great at the difficult conversations mm-hmm. and my chief commercial officer is she's like this is how you two are going to work really well together because he'll have your back on that kind of stuff and like you know it's just helpful yeah. to see so so garrett's been talking to her my son and she's kind of helping him figure out what your personality is what are your motivators what are the things that you know and then there's the de- derailers 
got to know those too. So, Mm -hmm. so smart. I'm glad you're teaching him that kind of stuff now, because that's not taught when you're getting your degree. That's not, it's not really even talked about unless you study psychology, that kind of stuff's not talked about. It's like, here's business, here's economics, here's marketing, here's communications. And then you get out in the real world. You're like, that person's mean. Why are they so mean? That person yeah. won't talk to me. Why, like, and you have no idea why it is. It's like, oh, they have a different social style than me. Their personality, right. they're analytical. They're just, they're not giving me a dirty look. They're th- look, they're thinking. They're not, you know what I mean? They're not, um, they're not not talking to me because they don't like me. They're introverted. They're shy. Like you're not mm-hmm. taught any of that stuff, which is why I'm doing the work I'm doing because people are people, it's not, it's not because anyone has a has a um is dysfunctional that way it's just because people don't necessarily know all about it unless you're really wow. interested in it that's i love that i never even knew an industrial psychologist was a thing i'm like wow this is pretty mm-hmm. cool it's fascinating it's and fascinating. that traction when they do a different test it's called colby i think and my team we did that one too and it was that was hysterical so apparently i was the outlier from my executive team and um what she was describing, like some of the characteristics. And she's like, okay, so sense of urgency for Lorette is nine out of 10. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. The, everything's right the now. The rest of the team is about four. I'm like, yes. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Yes. I was like, and it's validating. You're like, I'm not crazy. It's just, that's my sense of urgency. And PS <laughs> you're leading the company. So of course you're like, everything's like, right. I had an idea. Of course she it's said urgent. That's like, exactly, you know, that's where you're supposed to be. But yeah. And then, yeah. So she's like, you can see conflict sometimes with your Lloyd, for example, who's a two, but he's, he's getting facts before he makes a decision. So that's why, yes. you know, I'm like, yes. and I need him to get the facts because I'm not getting those facts. Of course. I you hate, hate probably hate getting the facts, right? <laughs> I, I worked for a guy like that. And I'm um, same thing, very analytical. He's always about, well, is it in the spreadsheet? And did you, I'm like, Oh my God. Like, no. and you, you, it was part of my job. <laughs> strong on it. He wanted me just, he, he wasn't just strong at it. He loved it. I'm like, I can get, good at it. I can get like a B and you're like an A plus plus and PS you love it. I'm never going to love it the way you do. I'll do it because it's part of my job and you're, and I, you need it, but I'm never going to be like, look at the spreadsheet I built. Isn't it so cool? You know, I'm like, but you, but I said, I also couldn't build that program you wanted me to build if I had just analytical skills like you had. So right. um, I think we have to educate the people that we're reporting to sometimes. I think so too. And I did. Do, do you ever hear the book? Oh, what's it called? Mindset a little older of a book and a couple of years old now at least. And it was talking mindset? about um, what? Are you saying mindset? Mindset. And it's about like the difference between a growth mindset yes. and- a Carol bad. Dweck. Carol Dweck, yep. That, isn't that good? Yes. And I think about that with the A versus the B. B is sometimes good enough, right? And it's like, you don't really want the perfectionist and the valedictorian all the time because- they got to learn how to fail, you know, right. and be okay with that and not have that be the standard. I just, I thought it was an interesting way to think about failure, really, you know, being okay to not have to be perfect. Yes. Yeah. That's a great one. That's, that, that's so many things have sprouted from that book. In her, in her mm-hmm. research. She has a, I think she also has a TED talk, Carol Dweck. Does she? Oh. Yes. There's so okay, many. So huh? There's so many. And then so I many know. TV There's shows so to keep up with. It's like, it's just not our time to say. Podcasts and TED Talks, <laughs> I know. Okay, so um, so one of these questions you can answer, you can answer either one. Uh, this will be the final question. So what do you wish you had learned earlier in your life or career? Or what's the greatest gift you offer the world every day? You can answer them both or you can just pick one. It's up to you. Um... You wish I, would hope, I would hope, I would hope that the greatest gift that I offer my tribe every day is, think this is including my kids. I got multiple tribes. Leanne's part of my tribe. She's <laughs> <laughs> my kid tribe, my work tribe. I would hope that I allow people to bring themselves to work, to this family every day and not feel judged, not feel um, shamed. I, Brene Brown stuff, the whole shame thing, and really just be themselves and be able to shine and do what they love and do what their talents, you know, and feel proud of themselves. So that's, I hope, a gift to that. And I, I believe I do my, I got a really sweet Mother's Day card from my 25 year old. So it kind of talked and it made me cry, of course. So, so that's the gift one. Um, you let people shine. You let, let people yes. Shine. Yeah. And, and acknowledge their shining, you know, like, yeah. ooh, that was cool. I love that. 
I think as far as what we wish we learned when we were younger, um, I used to probably still do, but I was going to say I used to care a lot more about what I remember we would do employee surveys when I just started at Ed Long and my dad would be like, go have a Merlot, relax. (laughs) (laughs) It's okay. I would take it all so personal. And so, and maybe that was okay, especially at the time, but I think not taking that stuff. So, you know, so to heart and just, you know, being yourself and not one of my children, my 21 year old, I think he's like the best at that. He just doesn't get, it rolls off his back. Doesn't care. I'd like to take a little of that. I admire that. In him. I do too. I would love, I have a son that's more like that too. And it's just so nice, but I think it's either you, you have, to, if you don't have it, you have to learn it. I think some people are born with that. I don't think it's very common. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's more of a male trait too, just to let things roll. Like, so what that has nothing right. to do with me. And I think it's easier for them to let things roll off their back because they don't take things personally like women do as easily. Yes. My dog just opened my sunroom door and they're vacuuming. So oh, I don't, e- oh, I don't even hear it. Good. Oh, good. Yeah. I like, oh. It's so funny. You, you think it's right on top of you. I do the same thing. I'll be like, can you hear the owl? Can you hear the fire truck? No. Right. Yeah. And this That's dog, funny. she does this all the time. She just walks in. I have three dogs here right now. So one is leaving on Monday and going back to Colorado. Yeah, no problem. I can't even hear it. Well, um, okay. So if people want it. So, so, um, do you want to share information about your company or, or, um, what do you want to share? Tell people um, about. yeah, I mean, I think as far as Ed Long, I think LinkedIn is a great way to follow us. That's where we put a lot of, a lot of our, what we're doing and our social media and, you know, even our philanthropy stuff. And uh, we did some really unique, videos for our essential workers over the whole thing and so i think that's a great spot to kind of get to know who we are and our website of course um just oh. www.edlong.com and um and yeah and i'm Lorette. and if you want to reach out to me feel free any, any final words that you want to t- say to, to the audience like about growing and, and learning and being peaceful happy and content um i think huh i think if you're growing and if you want to, you know, if you're running a company or leading a company or even a department or a team, it's only going to grow, I think, to the extent that each individual continues to grow mm-hmm. and continues to keep developing both personally and professionally. You know, I think you got to you got to make sure you take care of both sides of that equation. The soul side, too. <laughs> I love that. If you're and I, I was just. um telling a future employer this um, the other day, like you're, you're, um, if your employees are growing and developing and learning, so will your company. But if they're not, you, you're going to stay stagnant too. Right. So it's in your best interest to nurture that development, and, you know, encourage it, nurture it and, and welcome it because. Right. And I think, you know, it's, it's, I have never, ever dreaded, well, I can't say never, ever, but rarely ever dreaded going to my job, you know, going into work. I think it's, it's never been boring. And it's a, it's a journey. And I would, it's just so nice to be around people in a, in a community that there's, there's true caring, you know, we're all in this together is one of our values. And we win a lot of awards on people getting why they're there, the value that they bring every day, but also the enjoyment of being united. We just, that one of, that I'm so excited about that we just won that I don't, you probably didn't see, maybe, I don't know, but um, it was the Daily Herald and it was um, best places to work in Illinois. So we ranked number eight on that, but we ranked number one on best places in Illinois to work for women. What? That's awesome. Isn't that insane? I, oh, I was so like, especially like I was saying, like this year, that award couldn't mean more to me, you know? So, uh, so you should be very proud and um, you should be very proud of we, that. We all are. It's definitely not just me, but I think, and then the, yeah. And we, we have great men too. Yeah. Well, we no, but celebrate. Really yes. Do. We celebrate the men that support women. I mean, and that's the kind of men I think that I have great men. And yeah, and they're, they're just as excited as we are. So that's cool. Uh, congratulations. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on all the work you're doing and, and um, your success and, and getting where you are and, and being a people person while you're there. Because I know, I, I'm sure we all know several leaders that get there and then stop caring, or maybe they didn't care about, about anyone along the way. And it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah. how, because they're at the top. So that's um, what it's all about, or why do it, you know? Yes. Yes, for sure. Well, thank well, you. Well, thank you for having me on. It was my pleasure. Yeah, it was so, nice so fun. To see your face again. Yeah, we're you too. Do, we're well, thanks everyone. Okay. Um, 
take care. And I'm sure everyone's going to get very inspired when they listen to this conversation. Thanks. I hope so. Sure. All right, bye-bye. All right, bye. Thanks for listening. If you love this content, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you found us on. You can get all my social media links in the description below. Help us keep the momentum going so that every person can live their lives happily doing work they love. 